It's been a whirlwind of events for Jesus after his baptism by John in the Jordan River. Healings and casting out of unclean spirits and sparring with the religious leaders over what is lawful on the Sabbath. Of course, we remember we are in Mark's Gospel and that story and Jesus are both driven by a sense of urgency in doing the work of God's kingdom. So even this early in the story, we're only in chapter three, it has become obvious to everyone that there is something about this Jesus. The crowd see it perhaps most clearly, even if they don't understand what they're experiencing. They know that this Jesus is powerful. Not like Rome is powerful. It isn't brute force that gives him his power. He doesn't use fear tactics. Now his power is something beyond this world, something bigger than the petty schemes of political power grabbing or empire building. Whatever this power is, the crowds know it is good. It is healing, it is restorative. The crowds follow Jesus, they pursue him, they close in on him, desperate to be near his life-giving power. But perhaps to those around him, his family, those closest to him, this power, this sense of urgency in Jesus was something to be feared, but in a different way. Maybe he seemed frantic, moved so deeply by all the suffering, preaching on all these new ideas. They felt the power, but they saw it as something that had power over him, and not in a good way, a way that was taking him out of himself, driving him out of his mind, tired, overworked, little time to rest, or even as we heard in the first few words of the gospel, to even eat. Jesus' family came to intervene to bring him home, to get him away from all the demands and burdens of the suffering crowds. Or maybe his family didn't really fear what all of this was doing to Jesus so much as they were afraid of what he did, well, because of that, what might others might do to him as a result. But no matter their good intentions, it wasn't what he needed. He wanted them to join him in the cause of the kingdom. And the scribes, the religious figures, they were afraid too, but not for Jesus. No, like they were afraid of Jesus. Or rather, afraid of something that they just couldn't define or understand. And so to seek to control things, to control Jesus, they put a label on him. Scribes said that his power was of the devil, of the ruler of the demons. Everybody's missing the mark. The crowds at least are in awe of Jesus, amazed by him seeking the healing he can offer. But the the rest resort to just what boils down to as name calling. If you listen to the labels, Jesus is either crazy or he's demonic. You know, the funny thing is that the ones just a chapter before who most clearly understand the power that is in Jesus are the unclean spirits. And they cower before him. They identify him as the son of God. But Jesus tells them, shh, hush, keep it to yourselves. The power of God, the work of the Holy Spirit is right there among them all. No one really gets it. And several go so far as to completely misname it. Even unto naming it as the opposite of God, evil and unclean. So what does Jesus do? Well, he unravels the whole thing one misplaced stitch at a time. He starts with the scribes. He asks them, how is it that Satan can turn against Satan. And really, nice try, but tell me exactly how this works. Why would a power undermine itself? A kingdom or a house that is divided against itself cannot stand. 
And haven't we seen that to be true? In our own history, in our own government today, in our own lives as individuals. I think we've all probably had moments where we were faced with a choice. Something that went against everything we believed in. And for whatever reason, because there's always a reason, and it's never a good one, for that reason, we choose to go against ourselves. What did it do to you? Maybe you had instant regret and shame, sleepless nights, a sense of self-loathing. Or maybe it was just fine and without consequence, at least for a while, but then eventually it chipped away at your well-being, eating you up a little inside. No matter what it seemed at the time, in the long run we learn it's never worth the cost. We always lose something when we turn on ourselves, when we divide ourselves. And who are we? Well, first and foremost, we are beloved children of God. We're held in the power of the Holy Spirit as followers of Jesus. And perhaps on our best days, when by grace we manage to follow him and the will of God, well, then we are more than his followers. As he said, we are his brothers and his sisters. And because that is who we are, there will be those who call us crazy or out of our minds people who demonize our actions in order to contain or control us. But before we get too high and mighty on that point, let us stop and think, because I'm willing to bet in this day and age, in this time in which we live, we are all guilty of that name calling and that demonizing. And if you aren't, well then God bless you because you are a better person than this preacher standing right here. A fellow pastor in our text study told on himself this past week as, he, as we all talked about the scripture and how we might preach about it. And he outed himself for yelling at other drivers in the privacy of his car, mind you, but still in all, name calling. He said idiot seems to be his word of choice. But then he said he usually follows it up with Jesus loves you. Now that's not to justify the name calling. He says it's to remind himself of that truth. That that person he just flared at in anger and called an idiot is someone God loves. And then I followed that up with my own story of how I got some angry gestures one day from a fellow driver. And I immediately suspected that the guy was right. You see, I, I knew I'd been in some sort of state of autopilot and, well, I'd probably done something stupid, although I didn't really know what it was. All day it bugged me that maybe, just maybe, that guy was going around the rest of the day telling people the story of that stupid woman who almost, whatever I did, and thinking all day to myself, and maybe he wouldn't think about me that way if he knew that I was sorry for it. We rush to judgment. We are angry. It is a divisive world. The lines are drawn. How do we cross them? How do we have accountability as needed, but without tearing ourselves and each other and our communities and even families apart in the process? How do we reestablish that beloved child of God identity first and foremost before all the other labels? before we call someone an idiot or out of their minds or demonize their actions. Jesus didn't engage with the opposition. Well, he did, but not in a way that stooped to their level. He stuck to his identity as the son of God. So he asked questions and he looked for discourse and conversation. Now, you might be thinking that it did sound a bit harsh and judgmental when Jesus tells the scribes they've committed the unforgivable sin. But let me help with that a little. See, here was Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit working right there in the midst of them. 
But the scribes are so afraid of losing their power that they're blinded to the very work of God and in such opposition that they actually call it the work of Satan. What hope might they have to believe that they need forgiveness for anything? Or to be moved to see that forgiveness and grace is possible? Nothing is unforgivable in the scope of God's grace. But how do you forgive a sin that isn't acknowledged? How can that forgiveness be received? If the work of the Holy Spirit is labeled as the work of evil, how can there be faith enough to be moved and changed by God's forgiveness? Now, as Lutherans, we say we can't believe and trust in God on our own. We need the Holy Spirit for that. But if the Holy Spirit so outrightly rejected the hope of faith to receive forgiveness as well, not impossible, but improbable, Jesus isn't judging. He's calling it what it is, pointing out to the scribes the very thing that they don't have eyes to see. Jesus dismantles the labels that, he, that have been imposed on him in a clear and concise manner. The power of Christ to dispel the unclean spirits, to heal what is sick and broken, to forgive, to follow the will of God, even and especially when it's the harder path, he shares that power with you, with me. The Holy Spirit claims and seals us, marks us in baptism. We enter into the water as that old Adam, that old Eve, but we come out of the water called out of hiding, called out of shame, called into God's presence, loved, forgiven, and clothed in grace. And that bestows on us a freedom that is powerful indeed. The freedom, the power to do good stuff anyway, even in the face of ridicule. Now that Jesus carried on, perhaps, only proved to them that he was out of his mind, that he was in league with something other than the forces of the world. And those folks were trapped in something that they didn't see or even know they were trapped in. It isn't easy. We get trapped too. We will take those wrong turns. We will sell out at times for whatever that reason is we do. And it will cost us some joy and some peace. But never in the long term. Because the grace of God is bigger than that for those who have received the Spirit. For the sake of the disciples for the sake of the sisters and brothers, for the seeking crowds, for the misguided, well-meaning family members, and for the name-calling scribes, yes, them too. Jesus goes to the cross, and by the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is raised up to new life. And the divisions within ourselves, within our communities and our families, those divisions that threaten to topple us, to take us all down, Jesus says it doesn't have to be that way. Those divisions don't have to win the day. And he's willing to be the one that binds us together as family, grounded in our identity as children of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, faithfully seeking God's will, and an end to the name-calling, the demonizing of the other side opening our eyes and our hearts to, to one another and being changed, formed into ones who see the Spirit at work in everything good, everything life-giving. We may even dare to see the Spirit at work in ourselves. And maybe we will judge to be, be judged to be out of our mind by the world's standards. But we are held and we are caught up in the grasp of God's grace. We are held and caught up in Jesus, in his life and death and resurrection. And so this crazy stuff that we gather around every week, some book and some water and some bread and some wine, some other mismatched people that we're bound to and call sister and brother, 
and all that stuff. Christ is at work, and the Spirit's power is moving. So I leave you with this parting thought from a professor and theologian, Stanley Harwas. And I paraphrased it. Not because I didn't think you would understand it, but because I was afraid I wouldn't say it right. So here we go. He said that modern Christians make the mistake of thinking it's our job to help the gospel make sense to the world. It's really our job to help the world realize why the world doesn't make sense without the gospel. So if we're out of our minds, so be it. We may be saner than anyone because of it. And we're in good company together with one another and with Jesus. Amen.